Good morning, Minecrafters, and welcome to Season 2, Episode 5, Resilience, How to Cultivate Survivorship. You know, this is really about poker, really, right? Learning how to play the cards were dealt. You know, it's it's easy, you know, to, to uh, you know, we're dealt, you know, a full house or royal flush. It's not too tough to play that hand. And it really, this is about learning how to play, you know, how to play the cards. And we, we're just dealt shit. You know, and this discussion also, you know, opens up the nature nurture thing. Or, or really more recently, we would really say epigenetics, right? So we've got genes. We're all predisposed to stuff. Some positive, some maybe not so much, right? And there's environment. There's what we, you know, what we grew up in, how we, how we grew up, as well as, you know, what happens along the way. You know, this is almost cliche, right? You hear people saying, you know, that that was that was the hand I was dealt, meaning that there was only one hand. Well, we all know poker games were dealt more than one hand. So the very first, you know, uh cards were dealt have to do with, you know, maybe, you know, gen- uh, genetics, obviously we, we got in our hand, we have some, maybe some solid intelligence might be gift of athleticism, this, that, this, and there also might be some addiction in there, maybe some depression, anxiety, all kinds of different things. So there's that, uh, that original hand, right? And then there's the cards were dealt along the way, you know, the next hand and the next hand, in the hand after that, you know, it's like that old that old Japanese proverb of get knocked down seven times, you know, get up eight. And I'm paraphrasing that. Basically, that's it. It's about our bounce back. It's about our bounce back when we're up against adversity. You know, so obviously we're talking about the brain here, you know, mind power. And this is obviously the main theme of, of, of Minecraft, which is, which is to become the boss of our brain. And, you know, it actually, you know, almost saddens me when I hear people, the way they talk about this amazing three pound organ, right. And they talk about it as if it's some kind of tyrant, you know, some kind of tyrannical ruler, you know, that must be, a, must be obeyed instead of the captain of their ship. I mean, our mind is driving our life and it, it's unfortunate that they don't, you know, see this amazing three pound organ as, you know, more of a best friend, like a trusted confidant that's, you know, steering them through life. You know, I also, I I have kind of like a warrior mindset myself too. And it's not, you know, I, I, I have an image of the brain as a warrior just, but, and not looking, not looking for battle though, being ready for it, being ready. I picture a warrior's this, you know, strong, adaptable, malleable, you know, vigilant, awake, alert, you know, type of type of person. We're talking about the brain, awake, alert, and ready, and very, very strong, ready to pivot, you know, on a dime's notice. This is what we're talking about. You know, once again, we come back to that, to the word cultivate, which you know I love, especially being you know, living in northern Vermont, surrounded by beautiful farms. Right now, I have this gorgeous September weather. And uh, actually, one of my favorite things about the fall kind of fits right into here. People often talk about the foliage and the leaves, and that's all beautiful, too. Um, in September, though, I just, the, the corn, it, the, the rows of corn, they're just at tall and strong and gorgeous. And just the color just rolls across Vermont. And it's so, so beautiful. And we're talking about cultivate. This is a great time to, to, to envision this because kind of the harvest, the cultivation is, you know, just peak right now. You know, the summer we exploded with all kinds of great year for tomatoes and zucchini and just, just abundance everywhere. Rich, rich, rich farm soil yielding such crops. And we can just see this everywhere in Vermont right now. Rows and rows and rows of tall corn. So bring this into resilience. Right. Also with the crazy wind, you know, the tall fields of corn just go back and forth and back and forth. They're not breaking. They're withstanding it. They're still there now. They're beautiful. And this is this is what we're talking about with with resilience. And, you know, as we have spoken about several times 
throughout the podcast series about cultivating gratitude, right? We think about turning over the earth, that dark, dark, dark soil, turning it over, turning it over, and then and then the wild growth that happens at, at harvest time, right? And along the way, right? The corn doesn't pop up, gets bigger and stronger along the way. Well, the same thing is true with resilience. We can cultivate, cultivate survivorship. You know, as I've used the lottery example before, you know, it's not like somebody just sat back, you know, and 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 won the lot that you know the lottery ticket for happiness, or somebody just sat back and got the winning ticket for resilience. It doesn't work that way. We can learn to cultivate these traits, values, and virtues. You know, and we and we hear the same thing, like we also said earlier in regard to happiness. Oh, so and so just. She's just naturally happy or she, you know, and with resilience, oh, well, you know, she can just handle more than I can, or he can just handle more than I I can. He's just, he's always been like that. Okay. Uh, We can be predisposed for sure. I mean, we can't remove genetics from anything that involves human beings, right? We know for sure there can be somebody, we can be predisposed to emotional strength or predisposed to, you know, whatever, right? Athleticism, addiction, whatever. and We know for sure that the neurons of the brain, which means nerve cells, right, can be retrained, rewired. And we can say with confidence that this is a physiological and neuropsychological fact. Okay, so let's just start by defining resilience. And psychology today would say resilience is that ineffable quality that allows people to be knocked down by life and come back stronger than ever. Rather than letting failure overcome them and drain their resolve, they find a way to rise from the ashes. That makes you think of the Phoenix and Harry Potter. In a nutshell, resilience can be, fi- can be defined as the ability and tendency to bounce back. And there are certain components involved in resilience, right? Or like ingredients to kind of a recipe this fantastic mindset. And of course, like most things, wherever you read, you can see things like a little bit differently or read things a little bit differently, but there's some certain, you know, main, main components that kind of rise to the surface, no matter where you look. You know, and one of these key components, of course, is optimism. One's ability to remain positive most of the time. And this is another one that people often think, you know, Somebody got the won the lucky lottery ticket for no, okay predisposed again maybe, and we can learn this. In fact, Marty Seligman, Seligman, one of my favorites, father of positive psychology, is big on what he calls learned optimism. We can learn and choose and rewire the mind to look for the positive most of the time, and cultivate. This is a key key component. In resilience, and and Marty will will say this: optimistic people get through things, get through life with much more ease. They are better able to handle, um, you know, those waves of depression. They are they have more fun in life. They're more likable. They are more likely to get hired. I mean, optimism is is just huge, and also something again we can learn. And of course, there's you know good old fashioned grit. You know, metaphorically speaking with the mind, you know, to, to, to jump in, be, you know, the, sort of the, the willingness to work hard and get your hands dirty. You know, we have to work hard in life sometimes and be willing to just go the distance. And though, though um, grit and resilience are not synonyms there, it's very, very interrelated. And Angela Duckworth actually saw her speak a long, not a long time ago, a few years ago. And she um, sort of what, what uh, Angela says about grit is this: grit is a more recent import, and is defined as the tendency to sustain interest and effort towards long-term goals. It is associated with self-control and deferring short-term gratification. And Courtney Ackerman, in her article "What Is Resilience and Why Is It Important to Bounce Back," says this. Courtney says that uh, resilience is related to the same experiences, skills, and competencies, but she talks about the differences um, 
between resilience and, and, and grit as um, referring to the ability to bounce back from short-term struggles, while grit is the tendency to stick with something long-term, no matter how difficult it is or how many roadblocks you face. Now, personally, I see these as very interconnected and kind of inseparable, kind of like, you know, woven through a, you know, woven through a, a, like a blanket or something, you know, or an intricately, an intricately threaded, beautiful quilt, something like that. And this is because, you know, resilience does definitely involve this component of endurance. So to me, they go together. You know, I, I think of a, of a marathon actually, right? Cause life is not a sprint. It's, it's much more like a marathon, you know, with its ups and downs and times when we're so exhausted, we can hardly, you know, go, go one more step and we have to figure it out. And you know, I ran a marathon with our oldest daughter it's in 55. So I think it was about 47. And she, here she is, you know, she was this, you know, she's young and she's in shape. She's this athlete. She's this beast runner. Uh, and I run, I also run. Uh, but there was a difference obviously. And, and she just plowed through it. And I ran it in a fast five hours, which I'm very proud to say that I made it. Cause that was my goal was, that was it was to make it. And I did. And I also remember, um, the thoughts that went through my head, and especially they talk about mile 18 out of the 26.2. Wow. Is that true? All of a sudden, you know, your, my mind was saying like, what are you doing to the body here? Like, well, who made this choice? And you get to this point where you can just hardly just go another minute. And, and it's that just conscious choice making, even when you, you feel like you've got nothing left to just, to just go forward and, and towards that, Actually, the 26.2, that last point two, which is about the length of our driveway, no joke, felt like the longest part of that entire race. That last point two, I was probably going about an inch at a time, kind of dragging my feet. But the point is, the choice to continue to move forward and drag our feet is what we're talking about. You know, and this analogy with a marathon is quite relevant to what we're going through right now across the world with a pandemic, because obviously we didn't, you know, collectively ask the universe to, you know, throw us down this killer virus so that we could advance spiritually, you know, which is what we all did. We dealt with it in the moment. And in fact, and in, in where I teach, I, I'm so I'm proud of how we've handled it. We just pivoted right, left, all over the place. And we've seen across the world, all the, you know, the good that's rolled out of people. And now still here we are, in, you know, late September and it's still here and the fear-based energy is still here. And we've, it's, it's this odd feeling because we've kind of settled into being uncomfortable and being uncertain. It's a very strange feeling. And the way this relates to a marathon is, is just that it's about pacing ourselves. And the, the thing that's hard is we started out of the gate, you know, sprinting. Versus when you run a marathon, you know you're in it for 26.2 miles. So you kind of know not to start out really fast unless you're, you know, a phenomenal athlete and you're going to be in the top, you know, 10 or something. Uh, But the rest of us know to start out at, you know, and pace yourself. And that's what's, I think, thrown us a lot is we didn't start out pacing ourselves. We started out in this frantic, out-of-the-gate sprint. You know, it just sort of happened. There was no blueprint. No tutorial on YouTube. There still isn't. So we're still kind of, you know, wondering what's going to happen, how to handle it, how to do it. And so many of us, when the world closed down, it felt like a sprint. You know, it seemed like, you know, uh, every time you turn on the news, we're closing down restaurants, closing down this, closing down that. Fast, 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 hurry, hurry, hustle. Lots of fear-based energy in the air. And it felt like like more of a sprint. And I don't think, I don't know if any of us, of, of us actually thought when is this over at that moment. But I know for me and, and those of my lives and my students, everything, it just felt like just, you know, all hands on deck, deal with this in this moment. You know, and now, at least for me, it feels like I'm trying to regroup and start to pace myself because it's like a marathon and, and some jokester keeps moving the, the finish line back, right? And now I, I, the last I heard, I try to do a news fast and just dip in when I need to know. So obviously got to keep up with what's going on, but I certainly don't reside there. Um, and, and now, you know, I guess Dr. Fauci saying that it's going to possibly over, you know, overturning, that was the word, the United States for a year. And of course, you know, we're all part of one world. So what affects one country affects 
you know, we're all connected, right? So it affects all of us. And um, it looks like we're in it for a while yet. So here's the analogy of that mile 18 thing that I remember feeling like, what are we doing? What did and, and just that mile 18, you know, here you are, you know, three quarters of the way, a little more than two thirds of the way, whatever 18 is the math of 26.2 miles. And all of a sudden, like the body's starting to break down a little bit, at least for regular people running. And our mind is saying like, what are you doing? And we know that there's so much distance ahead and we're left with a choice, you know, do we just quit, fall over and get dragged off by um, the EMTs or do we keep going? Right. And those of us who've trained for a marathon, even though I wasn't, you know, some beastly runner, my whole motive was to be with my kid and finish. Um, that was a pretty big goal I had. I, I did train for quite a while just to run it in a fast five hours. I trained for a really long time and I was determined to make it. <clears throat> and it does come down to, to a choice and, the thing is, I think sometimes people think, you know, when does it get easier? And the disclaimer is, you know, it may not get easier for a while. And it does take a certain amount of, you know, grit and mental stamina just to make the choice to kind of become comfortable with the uncomfortable, which is definitely what a marathoner does, because it gets hard to move and breathe and everything, and to become comfortable with the uncomfortable. And what's even tougher is to be comfortable with the uncertainty. That's the biggie. You know, kind of really, it's really tough to like the mile 18 thing to, to kind of decide to just keep going forward full tilt. We're out of juice. And the thing is, what other, you know, what choice do we have really, right? And uh, what's really tough is when someone has responsibilities for other people. So obviously parents and even under ideal circumstances, right? If there are two partners at home and they'll say just financially, okay, I'm not talking about wealth. We're just talking about, okay, the lights are on rent or mortgage is paid, two partners, and the kids are neurotypical. That's huge, right? And it's still hard, really hard. You know, enter in some other, some, some differences here. Like there's a child with special needs. Uh, there aren't two partners in the house. There's only one. Um, you know, the, these are all big game changers. Or, uh, you know, somebody's taking care of, parent, or, or let's say, children and an aging parent during a pandemic. This is a lot. You know, when uh, Catherine King, she writes for Psychology Today, she, she's she been talking about how even those of us who have a pretty solid skill set for coping are really being pushed to our limits right now. Catherine says that uh, the, the moment we are living through challenges, people with even the most robust coping skills, we are witnessing the loss of life at a massive scale, fearing for the lives of ourselves and our loved ones, grieving for the life we knew before. That is huge. I keep hearing that from my students. Grieving for the life we knew before, feeling helpless, lonely, and perhaps more than a little angry as we see the daily injustices that COVID-19 seems to illuminate. I like that Catherine brought up loss. You know, she uses the word loss because loss, you know, the way we deal with loss is like grieving, right? And I've I've heard so many students and say grownups talking about things getting back to how the how they were before, and that's that's tough because here's the here's the thing, probably not going to happen. Some things might go back to like they were before, but I mean we're shifting and changing. There are a lot of things that are are probably going to continue to morph and molt into something else. I mean that that's just I think the reality we're dealing with, and this has us grieving because it's a loss. As we've talked about too, you know. Um, I had a, a friend of mine say, you know, it's almost like the pandemic's a trauma. And I said, no, 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 it, it's not like a trauma. It is a trauma. It's a trauma. And if anybody's had, a, you know, any, anything traumatic happen, you know, from a child, you know, zero to 18 ish, it's also flipping the switch on whatever happened before. It doesn't have to be the same thing. It can just flip a switch on that, on that scarcity and that fear. It doesn't have to be the same. In her article, uh, Catherine offers seven skills um, to kind of build resilience. And the first one, she uses one of my favorite words, cultivate. The first one, she says, principle one, cultivate a belief in your ability to cope. Remember, Minecrafters, becoming the boss of our brain takes, first of all, awareness, followed by choice, and then followed by effort or grit. None of it happens like the lottery lands on our laps. It just isn't how it works. So she says, cultivate a belief in your ability 
to cope. So even if you feel like you don't have that ability now, you can develop it. That's a beautiful thing. So Catherine says, when we're going through hard times like we are right now, it's easy to get overwhelmed, feel helpless, and start to wonder how on earth we're going to get by. It's important to validate these concerns. Validate, definitely. You can put your hand on your chest and tell yourself that it's okay to be scared or feel whatever emotions you might be experiencing. Take a few deep breaths and offer some companionship to your feelings. This is what we've also been talking about through these podcasts, right? That self-compassion. And the only way we can really offer that to other people in an authentic way is if we do that for ourselves, for sure. So Catherine says, we'd often be better served by gently and kindly acknowledging our pain in the moment. Tell your emotions, I see you. I love that. Her second one is to stay in touch with your support system, which we know, we've talked about this before, even before the Rona thing, right? We, we know for sure, evidence-based, that people who, you know, have the long, longest longevity in life and the highest quality, optimal, you know, life experience have good people in their lives. And it's about quality, not not quantity. And Catherine goes on to say that this is not the time to say, I don't have time, you know, for connection. This is the time to like double up on that stuff, right? Double up on the connection and and talk to someone. And, you know, honestly, I'm thinking best like a phone call. You know, a lot of people are zoomed out, but it's still, if that's what you got, that's what you got. Obviously, if you can do in person at a distance, that's even better. But however you do it, to actually amp up the connection now. That is a, this is definitely a time to amp up connection. Principle three is talking about what you're going through. You know, it doesn't help to bottle all that stuff up. You know, just find your safe person who will listen to you. Go for a walk, sit and have tea, glass of wine at night, something, and get that stuff out. You know, otherwise it's like taking a Pepsi can, shaking it up, you know. You know, we all know how that works. And then eventually um, you pop it open yourself and it blows or it just pops itself open. If you've ever had that happen, I have. This is just not a good thing. It's best to, to have some autonomy and let that stuff out, you know, gradually and in a healthy way rather than waiting for it to just blow, because it will come out one way or the other. There's also the passive-aggressive thing, you know, just kind of leaks out sideways. Best to just take control and, and, and have it and manage it. So Catherine goes on with the fifth principle, which is activate positive emotion. You know, and that's so Marty Seligman, right? We've talked about PERMA, you know, to, to, for optimal well-being and life satisfaction, that positive regard is positive emotion is, is just right up there. And Catherine says, it's so easy to get overwhelmed with the challenges the world is faced with right now, but we can't stay there or else we'll drown in it. So true. We can't reside there. She says, we need to actively cultivate positive emotions as an anecdote. She says, find things that make you laugh and commit to watching, following, connecting with whichever of these sources most amuse you right now. Find humor from pre-pandemic sources of entertainment. It's a good time to revisit your old favorite sitcom, stand-up comics, heartwarming rom-coms, and other art or literature that can reliably boost your spirits. This is great advice, Catherine. Next, principle four, Catherine talks about being being helpful to others. And we said this when talking about Gandhi, you know, when you're feeling blue, get out there, get out there and help somebody. There's also a dopamine fix for that. Perhaps, you know, the universe's world, the universe's cheapers, the universe's way of keeping us or helping us to be nice to each other because we actually get a little feel good fix from it. So, and Catherine says it can be very rewarding and empowering to help other people during hard times. When we see that we can make a difference and reduce someone else's pain, it reduces our own feelings of helplessness. Very true. It enhances our sense of control and efficacy in the world, which helps protect us from feeling overwhelmed. I can't tell you, it's so important to laugh. You know, best with best with good friends, family, and such like that. And also, you know, just it is at such a time for levity. I mean, not I'm also a big fan of documentaries, but you know, right now. Honestly, I kind of want the light stuff, the stuff that's, as people say, mindless. You just kind of sit back and laugh. And lately, my husband and I and our oldest daughter have been binge-watching Cobra Kai. And with our respective ages of 54 and 55, you know, the 80s stuff just has us cracking up. We went right through, you know, the whole 
first two seasons very quick, embarrassingly quickly, actually. And it made us laugh, laugh out loud. And that is so what we need right now. Then Catherine talks about uh, Principle 7 is cultivating this attitude um, to survive, this survivorship. And it's so true. Attitude is really everything, right? Because we are, you know, we are what we think. There's no question. So attitude can be our biggest asset or our biggest, you know, crippling disability if we allow that. And the choice is ours. And Catherine goes on to say, you know, the more we focus on being survivors, the more we will activate our inner strength and create a narrative that we can proudly carry into life after the pandemic. I love that too. And I like too that Catherine also brought up, think about through history, you know, people got through World War II and the Great Depression and, you know, the whole polio surge back in the early 20th century, never mind all the famines and there's just so many things worldwide um, that people have have survived and and come out stronger and better for it in some way. It's you know no matter what, it still comes down to the choice to cultivate this attitude of survivorship. And I'm, I'm feeling I'm like hearing the "I Will Survive" song in my head right now. Um, yeah. And lastly, uh, Catherine talks about the seventh principle being seeking meaning. I cannot say enough about this one. And my favorite psychologist, Viktor Frankl, you know, author of Man's Search for Meaning, this is one of the best books ever, life-changing, uh, you know, about we can seek and find meaning in everything. And it's kind of like if we're going to suffer or struggle, we may as well come out on top. And he is just my absolute mentor for life. Talk about the ultimate guru of thought control. It's definitely Viktor Frankl. And Catherine talks about seeking meaning from this. So however um, – that is, you know, whatever you want to tell yourself, like, uh, I can learn something from everything. That's kind of like the, the Victor Frankl route. God doesn't give us more than we can handle. Uh, whatever, to, to seek meaning in this, we can come out on top stronger, better, more empathetic people when we find meaning in our struggles. And, of course, the disclaimer is, you know, no one's saying it's easy. You know, Victor Frankl survived the Nazi concentration camps and every day was, I can't even put words to it myself. I, I can't. It's just it, his book, Man's Search for Meeting, how he survived, you know, daily uh, during the Holocaust is, is just, it was life changing for me for sure. And it, and it doesn't mean that, you know, minimize our own stuff. We still got to validate, of course. It's just, it's just a testimony to, um, we really do have that autonomy and it doesn't feel like we do because it feels so hard and bigger than, bigger than us. It really does come down to, you know, kind of making a choice to put one foot in front of the other, even metaphorically, you know, mentally, right? So I'd, I'd like to just add to Catherine's wonderful list here. And actually one of them is a little overlap because she talked about, you know, just, uh, you know, seeking out positive emotion, kind of looking, looking for that, activating it, bringing it inside the living room as I tell my kids, bring it right into the cabeza, right, right into the head, you know, search for something that was a good memory and bring it right in. And like we said earlier, um, with letting the good in, that can be uncomfortable for people. Now is a really good time to practice that, right? And what we practice, remember, we inevitably get good at. So the practicing gratitude, to me, is a huge part of resilience because the more gratitude we allow in, the more we cultivate the practice of gratitude. And the more, the more good things are like a magnet. We attract, good attracts good. So the when we practice gratitude, rewire our thinking to more positivity, the more positivity we attract, which thereby helps our bounce back, which is what resilience is, right? It's our ability to bounce back. Big fan of practicing, or let's say cultivating gratitude. And the other one is mindfulness. You know, I'm going to bring this up throughout because it's huge. Being mindful means being in the moment, being in the moment and living life right now, which means... We're not living in next Tuesday or Friday with all the worries and what ifs and catastrophizing or in last Tuesday and in the, in the month before that and everything that happened and with jobs and everything else. Being mindful is being right in this moment right here, right now. And that's huge for resilience, huge. And if that, you know, anxious or fear-based thought goes by, remember, we don't judge it. We say, okay, must be I'm feeling nervous in this moment and let it roll. Huge for resilience, just huge. 
And lastly, of, of course, I'd like to re remind all of my Minecrafters out there that with what other tips or suggestions, strategies we're talking about, that the bar of perfect is not one I want to strive for, I'll tell you that. And to adjust the bar, um, striving for perfection is, is self-abuse of the highest order, and I forget who said that, somebody famous and important. But anyway, it's self-abuse of the highest order. So it's it's it, to adjust the bar to do the best I can is reachable and attainable every day. Every day that bar is attainable. So if you're doing well with your resilient skills and doing great, slip up a little bit, you just say, okay, I'm going to start over right now. It could be 2.17 p.m. in the afternoon. And you're going to start over at, you know, 2.18 p.m. in the afternoon, whatever. Start. You can start your day over whenever you choose to start your day over. And I love that. We have autonomy. So adjust the bar and strive for do my best every day in every way. So I'd like to thank you all for listening, Minecrafters. And uh, today, I think, uh, since we talked about the, the countries, uh, it's 57% are listening from the United States. Everybody else is from all around the world, 41 or 42 countries. And today, I'd like to, well, thank all of you. We just did that. Thank everybody for listening. And today, I'd like to do a big shout out and thank you to Spain, España. Muchas gracias, España. I'm feeling the love for Spain today. We have... One of our daughters is teaching elementary children over there. Just got there last week. And, uh, yeah, big love for Spain today. So on that note, we're going to call this Corona Zillions, right? Resilience and bounce back during the pandemic. Corona Zillions. And on that note, this is Kimberly Quinn signing off from northern Vermont. Have a mindful day. Mm -hmm.